What is going on guys? Welcome back to another episode of uh, Kerbal Space Program gameplay videos by me. And in this video we're going to be building a space station and build it around Duna. And my goodness, this is a long video, um, which is a fitting thing because this the spacecraft we're building is also very long, kind of a weird association to make. A lot of this video is consumed by the time-lapse build of the station itself and the various rockets that we'll be using to get it into orbit. That's right, this is going to be assembled in orbit and then transported as one monolithic structure to Duna. So if you'd like to just skip the time-lapses, you're not too fussed about them, then you can skip to exactly 10 minutes into the video and that will take you to like the first of the launches to kind of get this thing going. But I think a lot of people like seeing these things get built, especially, you know, space stations, which take up some something of artistic merit, like, you kind of have to use the fine-tune building, like, it's not just slapping a load of fuel tanks together. There's a little bit of uh, finesse to it, if that's the right word. So I think some, some people like say they like to, uh, they like watching the time-lapses. That's what this part of the video is going to be, the time-lapse for the space station. And I guess, you know, this, I, I've been thinking about this, right, because a couple of weeks ago I said I was kind of toying with the idea of doing like an alternate history uh, Lockheed Martian mission, and by that I mean an alternate take on the mission that doesn't actually exist in real life called Lockheed Martian, but it's Lockheed Martin's plan to send people to Mars, and the program involves kind of constructing the Deep Space Gateway space station around the moon, and also building something called the Mars Base Camp around Mars, which is what I'm doing here, and here you can see me doing the symmetry exploit that I talked about in my Mun Ring station. Um, if you want some elaboration on how this works, then you can just watch that. I'll probably put a link in the description, because that video is kind of related to this. I was saying I, uh... The, Mar <laughs> the, the, the Lockheed Martian mission consists of putting a space station around the moon, it's called the Deep Space Gateway, and then constructing the Mars base camp around Mars, which is what we're doing here. We're building the Duna base camp, obviously because Duna is the uh, analog for Mars in Kerbal Space Program. And then the mission would involve kind of having these separate landers that can do excursion missions from the Mars base camp down to the surface of Mars, could then construct a small colony on the surface, and then get astronauts, you know, to and from. It'd be really, it would be pretty epic. So I thought, let's do that, but uh, make it kind of more Kerbal, and by that I mean have far more points of failure and just generally more explosions. So, we've built the Deep Space Gateway around the Mun. That was my rotating artificial gravity ring station, so incredibly overbuilt, very unnecessarily complex, and very cool. I hope you agree. This one will follow a similar kind of, um, like, the general layout of this craft is the same as the proposed Mars base camp. Like, it has the two kind of crew, mo like, two fuel tank areas either side of a big laboratory section, but this has kind of a built-out uh, observatory part at the end of the ship rather than an Orion module. And it also has that artificial gravity ring, not as a particularly suitable place to spend all of your time there because the diameter is really far too small for it to be a comfortable place to sit. But it's somewhere, I don't know, the Kerbals could just sleep in or things like that just to prevent muscle atrophy, bone loss, things like that. That's kind of what that thing's for. And then I thought, let's have some other spinning bits as well just because we can. So this thing here is I'm building is like a, a centrifuge so they can take samples from the surface of Juno or wherever or Ike and uh, stick them in those science containers on the ends of those that arm and then they can be extended and it will spin around and we could do some centrifugal experiments. I don't know, polymerase chain reaction, things like that. Um, now, that could be something that we could do. It's mainly there for aesthetics, I'm not going to lie. As is, let's face it, this entire space station. Space stations in Kerbal Space Program serve absolutely no purpose whatsoever. Aside from, obviously, you know, the laboratory has good function. Like, it's very, very exploitable if you want to just unlock the tech tree in, like, one launch. But, um... The, the things I use space stations for, at least, like, especially when it comes to things like artificial gravity rings, it, they're completely unnecessary. But... They are very fun to build nonetheless. So I've I'm, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm kind of constructing the entire... This is how I build all space stations as well, by the way. I'm kind of building the entire thing as I want it in the space plane hangar. And then what I'll do is I'll then split it up into appropriate modules to launch. The most difficult part about building this 
realistically is launching that gravity ring because you can construct gravity rings like modularly in this game like with docking ports and stuff but i always found it very finicky and they were a bit sort of wobbly and i, I just prefer launching them monolithically like this it just means they just tend to be a little bit more secure and less prone to cracker attacks because you can just use normal struts rather than having to rely on auto strut to keep the whole thing in place and you know, auto strut is crack and bait. And it is just easier to just build a single ring in the space plane hangar. But like I say, the caveat to all this is it's hard to make a realistic looking rocket when you're launching these big gravity rings because you have to have an incredibly wide payload, much wider than the, uh, you know, the widest diameter fuel tank, which is five meters. Uh, here I am also finishing off the rest of the space station. This part is actually the transfer stage, but I added this girder section with two relay dishes just provide a sort of a basic satellite network around Juno just to make sure that all of our craft on the surface should we put any on the surface can maintain a good connection to Kerbin likewise if the space station is on kind of the wrong side of Juno it can connect to a relay somewhere else and get to curb and get a signal back to curb in that way i'm only using two satellites we'll put one in a high polar orbit and one in a high equatorial orbit just because that's that's a pretty easy way to ensure very like reasonably good coverage like it's not going to be perfect the best way would be to put an actual ring of satellites around you know not in geostationary orbit mind one thing i would have liked to have done would have been to place a surface base on you know the surface and then put a geostationary satellite directly above it I thought that would be really cool. Unfortunately, you can't do that on Juna. I mean, you technically can, but not for very long. Juna geostationary orbit is possible, but it's almost exactly the same height as Ike. But not quite exactly the same as Ike. So eventually, Ike will catch up with you, or, you know, you will catch up with Ike, and then you'll get a gravity assist, and they will either fling you into the surface of Juna, or fling you out of the Juna system, or just put you on some other undesirable orbit, at which point you will probably encounter Ike again fairly soon, and then it will just, you know, finish the job. So this, that would be the next best thing, you know, is just put a ring of satellites somewhere fairly low around Juna's sphere, of, um, Juna's orbit. I guess sphere of sort of worked as well. I changed my uh, wording mid-sentence, which is not a great uh, thing to do. Anyway... Here you can see me <clears throat> well underway with the construction of the launchers themselves. We finished the space station layout, kind of. I actually modified this specific payload to include a big relay dish for the station itself because I realized it was lacking one and I thought it might be worth it because the actual relays we'll be putting around Juno orbit aren't actually the best kind of relay and I want this to be the best station it can be. So if those relays can't connect to us, something for whatever reason, they can hop off the space station's relay dish and get a better signal. That's what I'm adding here um i'm adding it in but i wanted like it to be believable that a kerbal could get from one end of the space station to the other without having to transfer through you know stuff like fuel tanks batteries sas units probe cores that sort of stuff so that's why for example you know those refueling modules that's why i added like passenger bays to the inside like i built them around passenger bays just so that kerbals can still traverse believably i know in this game you don't actually have to do that kerbals can transfer through anything um, I just like it, you know, from a perfectionist standpoint, really. The only exception to this is the actual core of the gravity ring. That's still just a solid rotor. I, I couldn't really think of a good solution for that because that's just a limitation of the parts. But I hope you forgive me. You know, I did put that fairing around the actual rotating mechanism to make it believable that there is something there that a Kerbal could kind of use to access the ring. But there we are, finishing off this section here. So this rocket is a lot more realistic looking than the first one we built. Like I said, we had to have an incredibly wide fairing just to kind of make sure we had the gravity ring safely enclosed and out of the way of nasty heating effects of at the atmosphere as we pass max Q during our ascent. I'm um, just adding these little probe cores to the tops of the upper stages of these boosters, by the way just to, uh, you know, make sure I can deal with them and not leave any debris in space like I always try and do in these videos. Now, you may... Uh, actually, you know, you know what? <laughs> I'll talk about this close to the time because that means that the viewer's retention will be better because there's going to be some twists. There's going to be some terms. Terms? Turns with an N. It's, there's going to be some oofs and some terrible events happen in this video 
because I am a bad designer. Actually, I'm not, but this comes into this drama later on, so I'm not going to talk about it. So I don't even know why I dedicated this much time to talking about not this thing, because I'm going to talk about it later on. But there was a problem with one of these rockets, in fact, all of the rockets, that I didn't realize until it came to docking them together. Let me just say that the docking in this video is easily one of the hardest docks I've ever had to do in this game. It was incredibly difficult, so I hope you I hope you guys are looking forward to it. Stick around. Uh, whilst I'm on the subject of, you know, doing the terrible YouTuber things, let me just say, smash that like button, subscribe, check out the merch, check out the Instagram. Look at this picture that I took. Oh, we're launching, by the way. Hello, everyone. They just joined, in case anyone skips to 10 minutes to skip to the actual launches. Ignore what I was talking about. I, in fact, actually, just ignore what I talk about generally. I don't talk about much in terms of, you know, quality content, so I don't know why I'm still talking about it, to be honest, because we're well underway with the launch. Off to a blazing start, not. This this rocket doesn't have great thrust-to-weight ratio, to be honest, but it does pick up speed fairly quickly. In fact, to be honest, it probably would have been better served with five masters and engines propelling that first stage rather than just four, because at a point when your thrust-to-weight ratio is too low, you end up actually wasting quite a bit of fuel because you just spend a lot of it just not going anywhere very fast when you could be going somewhere very fast and using that fuel for better things rather than, you know, just trying to inch off the launch pad very slowly. Uh, but rest assured, the other rockets are better. Like I say, this is the kind of the red-headed stepchild of the trio of rockets that launched this space station. It's very ugly, very cumbersome. Uh, the payload is too big. It was just... It's just a bit of a mess, to be honest. But, like I say, the other ones will be better. But that being said, all three of the launches, you may have noticed, follow the same sort of basic setup. It has, like, a powerful first stage. Obviously, that's what all rocket stages are like. First stage is very powerful. Then there's just one upper stage consisting of a Rhino engine and a payload. And the Rhino engine stage has a means of deorbiting... <coughs> excuse me. Oh, I croaked up for a second. Has the means to deorbit itself once it's inserted the payload into orbit so that we're not leaving any debris floating around in space, thus potentially endangering all of the seahorses living in low carbon orbit. And speaking of low carbon orbit, we are now in it. Look at that. So I kind of went with a goal or goal apoapsis of 80 kilometers just because our actual burn to Juno, I wanted to do in one burn because you may have noticed this video is very long as it is. Any kind of time saving maneuvers I'm going to take. However, it is going to be a very long burn because our thrust to weight ratio will not be very good. So we want to make sure there's enough gap, like enough space between us and the atmosphere such that we don't accidentally dip into the air and, you know, end up re-entering a, a curb in a bit prematurely. So 80 kilometers was a pretty safe bet, at least I guessed it would be, for this particular mission. And here we are actually recovering the booster kind of SpaceX style, like I, I say kind of SpaceX style because we land it unharmed under its own propulsion, but uh, we don't land it in any kind of specific specified area nor do we use landing legs or have any kind of graceful, realistic landing. But regardless, we recovered it nonetheless. Now we can get a just crossfade across to the second launch. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, I guess we can just launch it. Off we go. So this rocket is a lot more realistic looking, I think. It does have very high thrust to weight ratio, so a real far cry from the rocket we just launched. Uh, so once we get, to, yeah, once we've got to kind of a fairly good pace and we're well on our way, I'm going to drop the throttle down to about half just to uh, make sure we don't end up over accelerating too low in the atmosphere. The problem is when you start going very, very fast, very, very low in the atmosphere, you end up just wasting a lot of your fuel fighting the air resistance. If you just keep the pace nice and low, you can cruise more efficiently uh, and then you can get to the upper parts of the atmosphere where it's much thinner and then you can do your rapid acceleration from there. Uh, so that's why I'm only using the throttle at half and now that lower stage is all burned out we can raise the throttle now we're using the lower thrust rhino stage and begin uh, kind of coasting our way up into orbit so now we're much much higher in the atmosphere where it's far more tenuous don't have to worry too much about keeping our speed low we're just going to start coasting our way to orbit we're going to open up the map screen open up the apoapsis marker and watch and our target indicator is pretty close not perfect but it's pretty close i mean this is by no means a docking tutorial like, if you want to go, do I've, I've done docking tutorials before, there are lots of docking tutorials on YouTube, like the one by Scott Manley that is very good, I recommend that one to be honest. Uh, this is just, 
I, I'm just doing a docking. So this is me doing that. Um, there we go. 3.1 kilometer separation uh, within one orbit, which I don't think is too shabby whatsoever. We can deploy the payload fairing and get ready to coast our way up to our maneuver node to begin our circularization burn. I wasn't trying to get too close. Like, I probably could have got the, uh, you know, separation nodes a lot closer if I tried a bit harder. But the thing is, once we once we do our orbital insertion burn, it's the maneuver node is not going to be that accurate. Like our predicted separation nodes are not going to be reflective of what our actual separation nodes will be once we do that burn. So I don't try to get things terribly accurate, whilst I've still got lots of big burns to do, such as you know doing our circularization. So now we've got the circularization out of the way, we have much smaller delta V increments to work with, and it's much easier to get accurate encounters using the maneuver node maker. You can see we have a separation of 0.1, which I will take. <laughs> we will just time warp our way around. As we get close, we'll point retrograde relative to our target, kill off all our speed, and then gradually start burning towards our target using the target node on the nav ball. And continue until you get a zero kilometer separation, which because I had a fairly close separation anyway, only took kind of one little burn to get an encounter. And there it is there. And this is the part where I said that I had a very, very, very difficult time getting this thing docked to the rest of the station. The reason is I didn't put any modern propellant thrusters or at least external ones that can do kind of uh, H and N like forwards and backwards. I can only do lateral monopropellant thrusts because those Mark, those Apollo style command pods have ones built in. And the reason why this is an issue is because the docking port that we need to, you know, attach to the rest of the space station is currently holding that Rhino engine. So once we detach the Rhino engine, the only means of propulsion the space station stage will have are the monopropellant thrusters. And we need to be able to, you know, thrust it towards the space station, which we can't do because we can't do forwards and backwards. So um, it was very frustrating. So you can see, I think at this point during the video, I was blissfully unaware of the problem. Um, and as in, at this point in me flying the mission, I was blissfully unaware. And I think here, I was starting to realize that there were no RCS blocks. And I'm not sure why or where they went, because I definitely added them. Like, look, I, I reround the footage of me building it. And here I am placing the monopropellant blocks. I think what I must have done, because I kind of built the space station and then I went to work and then I came back and loaded the space station and carried on building it. I think I must have just loaded the auto-saved craft rather than the actual craft, which meant that some of the changes I made were omitted. So this is the solution I came up with. I'm going to point towards our target, trying to get as fairly aligned up as we can. We're doing a very small thrust with that Rhino engine to get our speed up to 0.5 meters per second. We're then going to control from the docking port we need to attach to the space station, quickly get this booster out of the way, switch back to this one. Obviously, the space station we're docking it to as well has no control points, so it's a complete dead weight. We can't do the loud la lazy method of docking either, nor can we do and We haven't got any Kerbals with us either, so we can't even do any, can't get a Kerbal across to control that ship. So this is, a, this is the only ship we have to control. So I'm just cozying towards it, and I'm using the RCS thrusters to try and keep our prograde marker dead centered on the target indicator. And then hope to hope to the crack, pray to the kraken that will uh, stay aligned. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Just keep the target indicator centered, and boom. So uh, I'm not gonna lie, guys. I it did take a couple of attempts. That wasn't the first attempt, uh, but I did it nonetheless. So that was a pretty. I was a fun challenge when it comes to docking. Do you know what I said earlier about there being twists and turns? That was it. You can click off the video now. Uh, thank you for watching, everyone. Be sure to... No, so here I am just checking out the gravity ring. Of course, uh, I wanted to have a slightly lower RPM than what I just did. I wanted to just make sure the motor worked. Now, we've only got one ring. You know, the last time I put a rotating gravity ring in space, I had to use another one to uh, counter the rotation to have one spin in the opposite direction. This time, the ring is much, much smaller. So the actual torque produced by it is much, much lower. So the actual SAS unit on board the space station and just, you know, the weight of the space station itself is enough to stop it from spinning the opposite direction to the rotating ring. And here we are launching the final rocket, the chunkiest boy of them all. So we're using the 5 meter Saturn V parts and what was formerly the biggest SRB strapped to the side just to give us some extra thrust. In case you're wondering why this thing isn't flipping over horribly out of control, it's because not only do the, does the thrust of the five Mastodons massively outweigh the thrust of that SRB, but the Mastodon engines themselves have thrust vectoring, which means they can, you know, you see what they're doing there where they kind of steer themselves, they can just steer to counter the offset thrust, center of thrust, I should say, 
uh, given to us by that SRB. But it's long gone now. It was really there just to give us a little bit of extra thrust to weight ratio just to kick ourselves off the launch pad and start getting towards thinner atmospheres uh, where there's less air resistance to power this big thing through it and this heavy thing. The reason why this is the biggest rocket, even though the actual module itself is arguably the smallest, I'd say it probably is the smallest in fact, or at least very close to being the smallest in terms of actual size, most of it is comprised of heavy fuel tanks and engines rather than crew modules, which by comparison are much lighter. Because of course this will be the transfer stage, and not only will it be the transfer stage, it also carries the satellites that will form a simple rudimentary network around Yuna. Who knows, I might go back and improve upon the satellite network and actually do like a proper ring of satellites, but again, I didn't want this video to get, to, to get too cluttered and try and focus on doing too many things because this is already a very long video for what is essentially a space station build. So I thought, let's just keep it simple. We'll just put some basic satellites up and then if I want to kind of improve upon it, I can just deorbit them and we'll put some better ones in their place. This is a good temporary measure for now. Besides, you know, we haven't put any Kerbals on the space station yet. You know, that's miles away. So we haven't got to worry too much about getting things perfect just yet. Uh, and then we are getting our, our final encounter with uh, the space station. <laughs> getting getting the transfer stage docked to it. So the separation is kind of close, so I was pretty good. <laughs> our target's slightly behind us, so I went for a marginally higher apoapsis than our target's apoapsis, only marginally because, as I'm sure you can see, they are, the target node is fairly close to us. And then we're going to do some playing around with the maneuver node again, not trying to get things too terribly close because the maneuver node burn is going to be so big. The actual predicted separation indicators are only going to be so accurate. I guess now we're at 65 kilometers above the surface. It's more or less space. Uh, and we can just deploy the fairing and, uh, I don't know, get ready to perform our circularization burn, I guess. So some of you may have noticed that our transfer stage does not consist of the sensible choice of a nuclear engine. Uh, it in fact uses the Wolfhound engine from the Making History DLC pack. Just because the Wolfhound is still a very efficient engine in its own right, but it has a much higher thrust to weight ratio than the nuclear engine, which means that our actual burn to escape from Kerbin will be much shorter, thus further reducing our chances of dipping into the atmosphere during that burn. And it also means that, you know, the flight will just be done quicker, like we could just do it, it will be easy, it will just be... I'm very impatient sometimes, and I like having a high thrust to weight ratio craft because we could just do things quicker, it's far more responsive, it's just a nice quality of life, and since, you know, we're doing this in multiple launches anyway, I didn't really mind having to add a bit more fuel just to get enough Delta V to get us to Juna, and besides, you know, getting this thing to Juna, it's not a massively tall Delta V order, I mean, we do have pretty much the exact right amount of Delta V we need, considering the fact that I didn't quite launch at a perfect Juno transfer window. I didn't actually look to see if we were at a Juno transfer window. Well, as in, that's a lie. I didn't purposefully get us into a better Juno transfer window. I just opened the tracking station, saw we were like pretty much there. So I decided to just launch and just wing it. So we're not at a perfect Juno transfer window. So we do have to do a slightly more expensive burn than we would otherwise have to to get to the red planet. So uh, it left us with basically no Delta V left in the transfer stage to do... Well, I guess we didn't need to do anything else because, just spoiler alert, we do actually get to Juna. And we do have to do an aero break. That was one of the things I wanted to avoid doing because, although we could do it, a bit unrealistic, isn't it? You know, we got all this sensitive scientific equipment and, you know, very fragile habitation ring on this space station. Probably not that realistic to go aero breaking at many kilometers per second to capture at Juna. But I guess that's, you know, well off into the future. We still need to actually get the engine attached to the rest of the space station. So here we are approaching our target. We can just kill off all our speed and have a look, see how close we are to it. Oh, there. Oh, are we going to point out? There it is. There it is. So we're going to be docking the th this thing to the space station via the senior docking port, which I find are really, really finicky and can often glitch out and just fling like fling apart from each other when you're not getting them aligned dead on. So in fact, without monopellant thrusters, which again, I added monopellant thrusters to this stage when I built it. I mean, it is totally my fault. I should have checked and should have probably just made sure I didn't load the auto-saved ship rather than, you know, the actual ship that I saved manually. But luckily this time, at least we have some level of control over the ship we're docking to, so we can kind of try and keep them aligned a little bit more easily than I could before. Unfortunately, we don't have a very good probe core on the space station, so we can't do the 
quote-unquote loud lazy method where we have them automatically hold alignment to the target because as you can see although this one can hold alignment because it's got a better probe core on it the other one can't hold uh, automatic alignment so we kind of have to uh and I don't think I realized this clearly. <laughs> just watching, just watching the video back. Like I don't think I realized that the other one isn't actually holding steady. And I think I realized here quickly when. Oh no 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 no! So killed up on my velocity using those RCS blocks, which are actually present on the ring stage. Hmm. Very interesting that. Uh, so I quickly decided to just straighten this out and just dock the space station to the. Uh, the transfer stage. I think I kind of did this a few nights ago, and I've only just got round to finding the title. It took a while to edit. I edited it yesterday, and I'm doing the commentary today. It is difficult, this YouTube thing, when you've got a full-time job, but I'm getting there. Uh, yeah, so I think it does look like I am actually docking the space station to the transfer stage. Now, the reason why I've got... Uh, well, I guess the reason why I've got a probe core on the transfer stage is so I can actually dock it to the space station. But another reason why I've got lots of batteries and stuff on the transfer stage is so I can deorbit it once it's kind of done its duty of getting this thing to low Duna orbit. Don't really need the transfer stage attached anymore once we've done that. So it's just like this transfer stage, even though it's not really the transfer stage, it's just the orbital insertion stage. Much like the other rockets, we could just deorbit it. Make sure it doesn't get left in space. I think I was a little bit overzealous with my re-entry and we ended up going a bit too steep and I think it destroyed the engine. And so we were a bit left, like, I uh, couldn't really do much without an engine, I think. If not, spoiler alert, would be the other engine, which which I know we didn't deorbit. I didn't forget. Actually, I did forget. But then I remembered. <laughs> so we will go back and... Oh, actually, do we actually land this one? I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I'm going for it. Ah. Well, it was a nice effort. Yes, this must be the one that the actual... Uh, I re-entered the atmosphere a bit too steeply. Anyway, what was I talking about? I think I was talking about how we'll be deorbiting the transfer stage once we establish low dunar orbit. Actually, I'm pretty sure I actually wrapped up that point nicely. So, obviously, we'll be deploying the satellites before we deorbit it, obviously. But, uh, you know, uh, that was the end of that tangent. We'll just watch We'll just watch this thing coast down and the slightly premature firework display. Yeah, at this point, I was like, okay, this is a um, big F. There it goes. Nice. Oh, we have some surviving. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, back here we are in space. Prepared to, uh, ready to do the next phase of this mission, which is now getting this long boy all the way to Duna. So you see, the first thing I did was select Duna as our target. And you can kind of see it's roughly at a transfer window, like a transfer window to Duna. If you draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Duna, the angle that that line forms at the sun should be about 45 degrees. And that would be 45 degrees. So that would be Duna is 45 degrees ahead of Kerbin rather than, you know, behind Kerbin. So if it was a clock... Duna would be the minute hand, Kerbin would be the hour hand, and it would be like, I don't know, ten past three. Something like that. I feel like I've unnecessarily dragged out this point. We've actually got the Duna, so I didn't even talk about getting the Duna encounter, but hopefully the footage spoke for itself just then. And you can see it's a fairly significant burn, just shy of 1,200 meters per second, and this craft, pretty heavy, pretty thick, not going to be the best thrust to weight ratios. It's a fairly long burn, nine minutes again, just shy, so... I was a bit anxious about whether or not I'd actually allowed enough clearance for this thing to not enter the atmosphere. Have a look at the green indicators on the bottom left hand of the screen. That shows our apoapsis and periapsis. We don't want the periapsis value to drop below 70 kilometers. Or I guess, you know, 68, 67 kilometers if we're really pushing it because the actual very edge of the atmosphere is pretty much insignificant. So there we go, 72, 71, and it peaked at 71.3. So just had enough. And, you know, because I, I calculated this all by paper, I'm actually very good at this game and think about things before I just randomly do stuff in, <laughs> in Planet Coaster in Kerbal Space Program. So when it comes to uh, getting our junior encounter, I'm just going to wait until the burn is nearly done. Then I'm going to close the maneuver node and just carry on burning by eye, just because the maneuver nodes don't always trans translate perfectly when you actually do the burn, especially when it's a long burn. So right before it finished, I just closed it and watched our uh, orbit indicator and just stopped when our actual orbital line got somewhere close 
close to Duna. We'll be doing an inclination change during Deep Space. It's more efficient that way and just a bit easier to just get the Duna encounter at first. Don't worry too much about what it looks like specifically. And then once we're in Deep Space, we can do a very minor burn. Like it'll be less than 10 meters per second uh, to actually do the adjustment to get into an orbit you actually want to achieve. So just playing around with anti-normal and normal at first to get our actual level level with <laughs> Tuna's equator great speaking there I'm just using time warp a little bit as well to make sure that we're actually going to be orbiting in the same direction as Juna's rotation just because although it's not quite as significant as somewhere like Kerbin Eve or Lath or somewhere like that it does still save quite a lot of delta V when you're ascending from Juna with its rotation like that's the reason we ascend 90 degrees on the nav ball from Kerbin because you'll be launching with Kerbin's rotation so it gives you like a free 200 meters per second of delta V that you wouldn't otherwise have if you were launching backwards so that's a nice bonus especially because you know when we're doing junior ascenders we want to make sure they're as efficient as possible so we can maximize the fuel we've got in the fuel reserves of this thing i mean to be honest i'll probably bring some sort of mining ship so this thing could be fully self-sufficient but initially at least we'll probably use some fairly bare bones landers uh, so we want to make sure they're efficient so any kind of uh, fuel saving maneuver i'll take and i think it's just a bit more satisfying as well when you're orbiting with the rotation of a planet i'm not actually going to be aiming to be perfectly equatorial though i'm going to be on a very 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 oh what i'm doing here actually i i ended up overshooting the orbit a bit and just use rcs using h and n to go forwards and backwards to do very minor adjustments anyway yes we're going to be aiming to be on a very 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 slightly tilted orbit like not perfectly equatorial just because if we don't get our base directly under on juna's equator uh, it might be a little bit tricky to get, it would be a bit easier to get ships back up to the orbiting space station if it's on a slight tilt so it kind of passes over more area on Juna's surface, if that makes sense. Um, that's just, re I mean, it doesn't make a huge difference in all honesty, but it's just something I decided to do. Um, it's just something I decided to do. And there is Juna. So we can create that maneuver node again. 624 meters per second of our 672 meter per second budget. So cutting it very fine. Um, yeah, we could just we could just execute that burn. I always I always try and talk really fast and then just go to the next point. And then sometimes I realise I haven't got another point to make. So then I just go, ah, uh, you know, stars look nice tonight. Which one of these is the sun? Does the sun even exist in this game? Squad, we want answers. So there we go. I was trying to aim for 60 kilometers above the surface of Juno. So our apoapsis is a little bit uh, eccentric relative to our periapsis. We're going to just time warp around to periapsis, point ourselves retrograde, and then you know coast our way the rest of the way to periapsis and just do a little puff with our engine and get ourselves roughly circular you know, 60 kilometers and 59 kilometers i'll take and you can see we've got that slight tilt there it just gives us a little bit more freedom as to where we build the uh, base doesn't necessarily now have to be on the Juno equator i mean it didn't have to be anyway because you know ships can launch into tilted orbits but I don't know. I think maybe I actually just did it by accident. Now I'm just retro. I'm just retrospectively remembering things wrong. Anyway, I kind of wanted the satellites themselves to be on an equatorial orbit, so we can quickly do an adjustment there. Use again some of our precious delta v, which has actually spiked up. Now we've not got to lug the rest of the space station with us. We've got an extra couple of hundred meters per second in our budget. Not quite enough to do much more with the transfer stage, though. So we're going to have to uh, deploy the satellite and get ready to. Uh, uh, deorbit the transfer stage and again the monopropeller thrusters had to disappear so i couldn't really you know get this thing i could get a really graceful exit for those satellites i had to sort of you know hit them out of the cargo bay but it was fine i'm sure that's what nasa would do in the same situation and we could just deorbit it so what i'm doing here is i'm deorbiting and then i'm using better time warp just to enable faster physics time warp just because then it not only speeds up the actual Re like Juno atmospheric entry process. There we go, using better time warp to speed up the physics. Uh, it also means that the impact will be much, much faster and it will definitely guarantee that we destroy the transfer stage and not leave any bits of debris on the surface of Juno. Now what we're going to do, we're going to do the first satellite, which is getting it into a really high... Uh, orbit around Juna. Initially, when I made that maneuver node, I got an encounter with Ike, so I just skipped the orbit a couple of times. To make sure we wouldn't be getting a gravity assist from Ike and getting ourselves onto a potentially undesirable orbit around Juna. Then the next thing we're going to do is get ourselves onto a nice spherical orbit. It's actually better in these sorts of cases to do an eccentric orbit, but I just prefer the way spherical orbits look. Spherical orbits, circular orbits, probably a better term there. So that's what I'm doing there. 
And then, uh, just because I know someone's going to mention it in the comments, I know eccentric orbits are better when you've got a limited number of satellites in your network, but I just like the way this looks. And it, let's face it, this is all just complete play. At this point, I may as well make this a series called, I don't know, Destination Duna. It's basically the new life on Lathe, isn't it? I do still plan on uh, reviving life on Lathe, but now we've had these beautiful overhauls for Duna, Mun... Ike, Minmus, and even Gilly. They look phenomenal. They're like new planets. So I'm just waiting for Lathe to get a similar overhaul. And then, then, my friends, I might reboot life on Lathe. I mean, I know. I've been like, I think I had a good run. It was, every, it was like a year ago since I did the last episode. Doesn't time fly? I still think of that series as being like a few months old. I was like, oh, wow. Time really does fly, doesn't it? And there we are. Those are the, by the way, those are the two satellites established. We could deploy the radiators, deploy the big solar panels, which me and the, the power provided by those solar panels means that we will never run out of electricity, even with all of the rotors going, because the solar panels and the battery buffer uh, supply adequate power that will never actually run out. They will recharge the batteries at a faster rate than the rotors can drain the batteries. And there is a little shot just there. So you have to set the torque fairly low for that gravity ring just to make sure that it doesn't spin the space station, you know, independently too much. But there it is. That's the video done. So I'm going to put some links on screen. On the left-hand side is just a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. On the right-hand side was one. Uh, it's been my most recent upload. There's also a link to subscribe and check out Patreon on screen if you'd like to. And in the description, you'll find links to Instagram, like I said earlier. Merchandise, Discord, Twitter, all that good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.